him the iniquity of us all, and he became guilty of all of it and all of its horror and terribleness. And that's how he died. What I'd like to do is to show you now how the cross of Jesus Christ is God's greatest moment, his greatest moment. You say, oh, I thought that the creation of the world was, listen, if all that we had was creation, we'd know about his power. We'd never know about his grace. If he had consigned mankind to hell, we'd have known his justice, but we'd have never seen his grace and compassion. It is there on the cross in what mankind may well describe as the darkest hour that God's attributes like a kaleidoscope were lit up in all of their glory and beauty and wonder so that even the angels of heaven were looking over and seeing what was happening and saying, we can't believe it. This is God at his finest hour. What are the attributes? First of all, Paul says in Romans 3.25, he says, God set Christ forth to declare his righteousness. That's the first purpose of the cross. You say, I always thought that the cross was designed to save me. Listen, the first purpose of the cross is for God to declare to the world his righteousness. It says that Christ was set forth publicly to declare the righteousness of God. Because, you see, God was serving notice throughout all of the universe at that moment that there was no such thing as him being able to forgive a single sinner unless payment was fully made for that sin. So that this man who writes to me from prison, who is an abuser, we often talk about those who are abused, but we're talking here about an abuser can be forgiven without God compromising his justice one iota. The only way that could happen is that there be a payment that would be complete enough and whole enough that men like this and like us, who could do the same thing, could be thoroughly and totally acquitted by God and God's reputation remain intact. That's what it means. The righteousness of God was set forth. Years ago, there were some atheists who wrote a tract to mock God. And in the tract, they said, what kind of a God has friends like the God of the Bible? They said, here's Abraham who told a lie to save his own skin, and he's called a friend of God. Here's Jacob who is nothing but a cheater, and he's called a prince of God. And then they said there's Moses who was a murderer and a fugitive, and he stands up and he tells people, thou shalt not kill, and God uses him. And then David came in for the most severe criticism. Here's an adulterer and a murderer who's a man after God's own heart. What kind of a God is that? And you know, in their perverse way, the atheists had a point. What kind of a God does associate with people like this if a man is known by his friends? What kind of a God are we talking about? Friend, the primary purpose of the cross is to remove the scandal from God's name and to clear his name. Because what he's saying and because of the fact that Jesus died and a payment was made for sin, that therefore, therefore, God can acquit the guilty and still, Paul says, remain absolutely just and untainted. That's the first purpose of the cross, is to rid God of scandal. The righteousness of God is revealed. Secondly, the truth of God is revealed in the cross. God was saying, I'm not going to turn the other way just because of man's sin. We're not going to sweep it under the rug. We're not going to pretend that nothing happened. Pretend it's all okay. He said, I'm going to look at sin with all of its horror, with all of its indiscretions, with all of the tearing that it brings about to the human race, and I'm going to face it squarely and totally through one offering perfecting forever those who are sanctified. I'm going to do it, and I'm going to do it right. The truth of God. We see the mercy of God, and let me add to that attribute also the grace of God. Because, you see, here's what happened. Now that God had taken care of all of the legal red tape... Now that man could stand acquitted in the sight of God, declared justified, God says, now there's no limit to what I can do for you because my own reputation is thus protected without compromising my holiness. I can give you so many gifts. 
He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not also with him freely give us all things? I can even make you an heir of God and a joint heir with Jesus Christ. That's what I can do. Well, my friend, this is Pastor Lutzer. I hope that you understand, based on the message that I preached today, that God cannot simply let bygones be bygones. God could not simply choose to forgive us without a payment, without His holiness being appeased. And that's why Jesus Christ had to come. You see, there are many people whose conception of God is such that they think that God simply forgives without a sacrifice. Well, He doesn't. And that's why it's so important for us to come to the God of the Bible and receive for ourselves the sacrifice Jesus provided. Thank you, Dr. Lutzer. Dr. Erwin Lutzer has brought part two of his message, Dying a Winner, another in his current series, What is God Up To?, a big picture overview of God's eternal purposes. We at Moody Church are making this eight-part series available. What is God Up To? can be yours on CD as our thank you when you give a gift of any amount to support Running to Win. For details, call us at 1-800-215-5001. That's 1-800-215-5001. Online, go to OfferRTW.com. That's OfferRTW, all one word, dot com. Or write to Running to Win, Box 11174, Chicago, Illinois, 60611. Next time on Running to Win, the dramatic conclusion to our visit to the cross of Christ. This is Dave McAllister. Join us tomorrow for our next Running to Win.